Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Ned Blackhawk, a professor of history and American studies at Yale. His field of interest is American Indian history, and he's the author of Violence Over the Land, Indians and Empires in the Early American West, a study of the American Great Basin that garnered numerous professional prizes, including the Frederick Jackson Turner Prize from the Organization of American Historians. He has also published numerous state-of-the-field essays for many of America's leading professional historical associations and has helped to build the newly established Native American Cultural Center here at Yale. Today, we'll talk with Professor Blackhawk about the Yale Group for the Study of Native America and his broader work to institutionalize Native American studies. Welcome, Professor Blackhawk. It's very nice to be here. Let's start um, with an overview of the um, uh, Yale's group for the study of Native America. Tell us about it and its mission. Uh, the Yale Group for the Study of, the, of Native America is an interdisciplinary working group on campus. Mm -hmm. uh, we refer to it as YIGSNA, the kind of acronym, mm -hmm. and it provides a um, permanent space and a kind of community for the study of Native America that draws upon Yale's largely graduate student, but also faculty and um, staff interest in this subject. Mm -hmm. And what's its mission? Our goal is to provide a, a supportive, inclusive, and advanced uh, scholarly um, community for interested um, participants who need or, or want to share their work with um, a professional audience of some form mm -hmm. and to provide even more so a kind of community around campus on these issues. Draw, it draws from various professional schools, we have a lot of law students, mm -hmm. um, from various academic uh, graduate programs and mm -hmm. also from an increasing number of uh, faculty on campus interested in these subjects. And how long has it been um, on campus here? It was founded in 2003 by a group of concerned graduate students that Yale, like many other private institutions at the time, didn't have a very prominent uh, kind of scholarly profile in the field mm -hmm. of um, not just American Indian history, which is my field of study, but also Native American uh, legal studies, Native American literary studies, mm -hmm. ethnographic work, um, art history, and other types of academic fields of inquiry. Mm -hmm. um, these students really kind of heroically uh, built a institutional space, secured funding for annual conferences, and set in motion some of the pressure on the administration to begin the process of mm -hmm. uh, hiring academic faculty in the fields. And what are some of the projects that you're working on with the group? We're um, doing lots of things, so it's okay. really quite exciting. Um, we run a, a bi-monthly working group mm -hmm. that meets in the newly established Native American Cultural Center. Uh, we showcase emergent works in the field from some of our graduate students who are finishing dissertation chapters or research projects, uh, doing initial kind of publications. We sponsor lots of uh, academic talks and events on campus. Mm -hmm. uh, this year alone, we've done two very large, um, at least in organization, um, conferences that have drawn uh, collectively uh, around 100 people to campus from across North America mm -hmm. on um, various kind of academically themed uh, subjects. Um, we also uh, run a dissertation writing fellowship mm -hmm. um, named after one of Yale's most illustrious um, early 20th century Native American graduates named Henry Rowe Cloud. Okay. This fellowship brings a visiting graduate student to campus for the year to finish their dissertation and is drawn from an international pool of applicants. Mm -hmm. And we provide the kind of scholarly community in which this fellow uh, does their academic work mm -hmm. and then presents it to an academic audience. Uh, we also run, a, not so much as a working group, but many of us are involved in other uh, Native American studies efforts on campus mm -hmm. and at Yale, including the running of a university press series with Yale in American Indian Studies. Okay. Are there a number of these kinds of groups at universities and colleges across the country or not so many? Well, Yale is kind of a very um, active academic community. Mm -hmm. So it has lots of comparable or 
heavily institutionalized academic working communities. Mm -hmm. um, there's this famous one that you're probably familiar with in agrarian studies mm -hmm. run by James Scott. Yes. Um, I have colleagues in the history department who run sets of these working groups. So when I arrived here um, about six or seven years ago, I began that, well, I, I, I worked with people who were involved in that earlier phases of this group um, mm -hmm. and helped secure kind of permanent resources for it. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're not unique here in a sense, except that we're the only group on campus or that does Native American studies, but we are in fact the only, to my knowledge, professional academic working group of its kind across um, any of the kind of leading private institutions oh, in really? North America. Okay, that's wonderful. It is, um, but it's also kind of sad in the sense that there aren't that many other advanced communities right. in this field at our kind of cognizant peer institutions. Right, right. So, um, the Cultural Center, tell us about that. What uh, is it comprised of? The Native American Cultural Center is becoming one of the most um, enriching uh, places on campus, I think. Mm -hmm. it's not, I think it's not a unfair to kind of use that very strong mm -hmm. characterization to describe this really um, vibrant, largely undergraduate student community, but um, very active and um, close uh, academic community mm -hmm. on campus. It's um, one of the four um, cultural centers on campus that mm -hmm. is designed to provide a um, secure and supportive uh, community for underrepresented um, students of color. In this case, Native American students and indigenous mm -hmm. students from across uh, largely North America. Um, we have Alaska Native students, uh, Native Hawaiian students, and um, nearly a record number of American Indian uh, undergraduates at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. And how many would that be? Uh, I think we're graduating 50 um, Native, self-identified Native American students this wow. year, which mm -hmm. is nearly 4% of the entire student body, mm -hmm. or graduating class. That's pretty amazing, actually. It is, and it reflects a kind of growing institutional concern mm -hmm. and interest in these areas. Um, the center is only two years old now, so it has really kind of state-of-the-art um, seminar space and um, kitchen and other mm -hmm. types of um, um, uh, amenities. And mm -hmm. one of the really most exciting things is that there were once mm -hmm. only one or two really active Native American student groups on campus, and mm -hmm. now we have eight or nine. Wow. Uh, both undergraduate and graduate students. Mm -hmm. And all of them generally use the center as the site for their mm -hmm. meetings and a lot of their events. Um, and are they broken out by bas basically different um, parts of the country in terms of the Native American nation that they're affiliated with? Um, less so. There are some, okay. at some institutions, there will be like a Native Hawaiian group mm -hmm. or a Navajo student uh, community um, uh, club or some kind of association. Mm -hmm. uh, these groups are kind of organized around student interests and things like health or mm -hmm. our law students have a group or our N Native American graduate students have an active uh, group. Um, the working group is another group mm -hmm. that's affiliated right. in part with the center. Um, but the undergraduates also have a uh, drumming group or mm -hmm. community. Right, that, right. Yeah. So it's more, it's more than just um, centered around the artistic part of Native Americans. Correct. It's yeah. really um, a academic as well as mm -hmm. um, kind of scholarly okay. and so, uh, social community. Great. So where would you like to see the, the cultural center go in the next five years? Um, what would be your hope It'd be for really it? nice to see a few uh, more additional Native American faculty mm -hmm. on campus. Um, Are you the only one at, the, at this moment? Um, in Yale College. Okay. Um, and um, it'd be really nice to see uh, some more kind of collaborative partnerships between campus and other Native American, uh, either institutional programs or even communities themselves mm -hmm. out in Indian country. And we've done a few really interesting um, collaborations with the Mohegan Nation here in Connecticut. We've had events at the Pequot Museum mm -hmm. also here in okay. Connecticut. And have recently hired a few um, uh, Native American community leaders from across campus to work with us in various ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Let's um, talk about your um, academic work. Um, mm -hmm. You recently 
uh, completed an anthology with Isaiah Wilner called Indigenous Visions, Rediscovering the World of Franz Boas. Um, let's uh, tell us about Franz Boas, who, who he is, and then let's talk a little bit about the anthology and what mm -hmm. it grew out of. Um, the legacy of anthropology mm -hmm. in the field of American Indian studies is really hard to overestimate or overemphasize. Um, uh, anthropology as a kind of scholarly field emerged in the late 19th and early 20th century mm -hmm. and really had as its primary subjects of inquiry indigenous communities largely in North America um, and the kind of leading proponent or the kind of institutional founder of that discipline was a German ethnologist by the name of Franz Boas who migrated out of Germany in the late 1800s and traveled around North America. Um, and eventually um, helped organize like incredibly extensive uh, cultural exhibitions like mm -hmm. at the World's Fair in Chicago in 1893 and eventually worked uh, for decades in New York City institutionalizing the discipline of anthropology at Columbia University and also building like the, um, the New York's um, Natural History Museum and, um, and then training dozens and dozens of future anthropologists, uh, many of whom would study native languages and begin recording uh, what they thought were um, disappearing cultural practices um, and really help establish a kind of academic vernacular and kind of institutional understanding of the peoples of the world mm -hmm. in which Native Americans were usually either the sentiment or the kind of pr um, primary uh, uh, ethnographically identifiable other to Western society's emergent right. sense of its own subjectivity. Mm -hmm. um, so we have this very um, robust now community of graduate students here, one of whom is writing an academic dissertation on not just Boaz, but the, particularly the Native American communities that shaped and mm -hmm. informed him. And he very relatively early on in his um, graduate training decided he'd like to do a big conference. And so using our Yixna working group and working with um, Macmillan where we held the um, uh, the event we brought together uh, dozens of scholars for a few days and mm -hmm. um, really interrogated the relative place not only of Boaz as a kind of ethnographic um, influencer of subsequent mm -hmm. scholarly debates but particularly those who shaped him okay and so the world around him and um, we came to a really kind of firm understanding that we shouldn't think of these intellectual leaders in certain scholarly fields as being singular figures, but mm -hmm. having been deeply imprinted by particularly their native informants. Mm -hmm. So we um, spent quite a bit of time working with these um, visiting scholars and some soliciting extended papers from them and have compiled them into a volume that really rethinks mm -hmm. The legacy of not just, in a sense, Boaz, but really of American anthropological thought. Mm -hmm. and, and so, what are some of the conclusions that came out of it? Well, um, a kind of primacy of uh, one of the kind of primary um, conclusions is that the world in which anthropologists were forming their ideas about native peoples was not something that they alone were constructing, mm -hmm. and that there are many attempts, both here and also globally where various ethnographic informants were trying to, in a sense, articulate a certain social or kind of cultural or even political vision uh, th through the discourse of ethnography. Mm -hmm. To, in a sense, have the ethnographer understand their concerns and potentially bring them to other colonial or imperial officials mm -hmm. or help redress the levels of, say, cultural um, censorship that they were experiencing. So. Boaz was most famous for working among the Northwest Coast mm -hmm. uh, indigenous communities, particularly in British Columbia. And those communities at the time he was there, and at the time he brought them or helped bring them to Chicago, were undergoing very heavy persecution of their cultural and religious practices. Mm -hmm. And so they saw in him an ally who could help articulate a vision of their cultural organization to outsiders at a time when government officials and missionaries and various kind of institutions of the state were heavily prosecuting them. Um, so we are looking at the kind of dynamic agency that indigenous peoples have been able to um, 
deploy at various times through mm -hmm. these sets of ethnographic encounters. Right, right. And uh, how do you think that would apply to um, Native America today? Well, I think it's um, relevant to think of indigenous peoples as having uh, been very active participants in the making of both the intellectual structures that have historically uh, under-recognized them, as mm -hmm. well as the larger societies around them. Right. So the idea that museums or scholarly textbooks or children's literature convey that these peoples are without history or primitive or somehow in inherently different mm -hmm. is in fact the kind of um, message that Native peoples have been contesting for uh, sure. generations. Thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing some of your work. It's been a pleasure. For more information about Professor Blackhawk and his research, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.